In Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, we read of the first mother. And Adam called his name Eve because she was the mother of all living. There's some things we know about Eve and there's some things we don't know about her. We, some could argue that she was made of better material than Adam because Adam, dust of the earth, Eve made from, from Adam. So I'll let all of you debate the pros and cons of that argument. But um, there are some things we know. We don't know how many children she had. In chapter four, we see that she conceived and bare Cain. She said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. The indication is that she thought this might be the promised seed that would bruise the head of Satan. But of course it wasn't. And then she bare again and another son, his name was Abel. Some argue that they were twins because she conceived once and bare twice. And that's a possibility because elsewhere in the Bible, they typically conceive and bear, conceive and bear. But either way, she had those two boys and later Seth, but also other sons and daughters. We don't know how long she lived. We know when she got married, how, how old she was. All right? She didn't have to go through school and young adulthood and wonder if she would marry who she would marry. So she, she married Adam and God officiated the first day. We don't know what it was like for her to be married to such an old man. <laughs> but we learned some things, and she learned some things. She learned that marriage was and is sacred. Mm -hmm. And Jesus taught it, one woman for one man for life. That still holds today. Amen. With all the confusion in, in the world, we know the Word of God provides clarity. We, we learned that marriage is and was about companionship. He lacked, Adam did, a suitable companion. A help me means suitable companion. But uh, God remedied that by forming her from the rib of Adam and bringing her to Adam. And we would like to think that he said to him, well, what do you think? Well, he smiled broadly. He liked what he saw and said, she just suits me. She was a suitable companion. So we learn uh, to teach young people who, uh, if they marry, who they ought to marry. You ought to marry the one you li like to spend time with. Companionship. It won't work real well if you marry someone that you've never spent time with, nor even like to spend time with. Well, good luck on that, because that's all you got is, is luck, and that's not a very good uh, precept to depend upon. So she, she learned that and no doubt taught that to her boys. She taught some other things. Maybe she taught about boundaries. Boundaries are a part of life. They're designed when they come from God to be protective. They are provided, not imposed, and she learned that in the garden. Now God gave an edict to Adam, it looks like, before Eve was formed, if this is in chronological order, which at times it's not. But Adam named the, the animals and realized that they had companions, but he did not. 
And so God caused a deep sleep to fall uh, upon him, and uh, from that, Eve emerged, or not just emerged, from, from that, God formed Eve. But Adam had been told by God, you may eat of every tree of the garden except the tree of knowledge and evil. Of that tree, do not eat it. Do not eat of it. Well, Eve saw the tree. I wonder what kind con of conversation that uh, Adam had with his wife after she was formed and brought to him and he had uh, this companionship. It was his responsibility to convey to her, now remember, we have everything we need. Mm -hmm. I mean, this life is good. Yeah. And she knew it was good. But there was something enticing about that one tree. Had Adam told her, now that there's that one tree in the middle of the garden, uh, don't eat of it. And if, if I were you, I wouldn't even go around it. But she did. And Satan was uh, subtle. She took of that, the fruit of that tree, ate of it, and gave to Adam, and he did eat also. So he was complicit. We see in the New Testament that he was not deceived. The, the woman was deceived, but he was just rebellion, rebellious. And so the whole human family has, uh, was plunged into the uh, condition of carnality, the condition of sin. And so when uh, Eve brought up her boys. She had first-hand knowledge of the value of boundaries. Mm -hmm. The responsibility of parents, a lot of that falls on mothers, but certainly not all of it, uh, to provide boundaries for their children, to let them know you can uh, have all of these liberties. But there are some liberties that will not be beneficial for you to have, and so uh, it's up to the parents to provide and the children would view it as imposed, but the, the parents view it as providing those boundaries. It's not healthy, it won't benefit you. I've heard of children who, who say, you can't just um, go through my bedroom. Well, for one thing, you're, you're lucky if you have, or you're blessed if you have uh, your own bedroom. I didn't have that growing up, certainly didn't. Uh, we lived in an old house, actually and an oversized attic. I'm not even sure it was that oversized, but uh, there was curtains between the three sections and the three girls stayed at one end and my older brother Gary and my younger brother Harlan stayed at the other end and uh, Dale and I uh, stayed in the middle. I suppose it was 500 square feet across the, the top of that house. It wasn't a, a big house, open attic. You had to be careful when you stood up, if you were at the low end, because the nails came through the shingles, and you know what that would do to a head. Uh, in, in the summertime, the windows were wide open because it was so stifling hot, and the, the, the bats would, would fly through those windows, which bothered my three sisters, but the boys, we didn't much know that that wasn't normal. Uh, in the uh, wintertime, we piled on the blankets because there was no heat, just a wood stove downstairs. So nowadays, uh, children certainly have uh, some benefits that we didn't have uh, when I was the same age. But the, the idea that parents cannot just uh, go through your stuff and go through your bedroom or control your social media access and all of that. Well, uh, let, me, let me ask you, who pays the utility bills? Who pays the property taxes and uh, the, the insurance? and even the access to uh, these things. When, uh, when you want freedom, that's when you get a job and you move out and you have freedom. Those bills come in every month and you have the freedom to pay them. <laughs> so it's all right. Uh, kids can't, uh, or parents rather, uh, need to understand that you, you simply cannot be your child's best friend when your child is, is growing up. That comes later. So boundaries, they're protective. I wonder if Cain asked his mother, well, mom, did you adhere to the boundaries God provided you? Oh boy, that was a tough one. No, she didn't, but she learned some things and she learned the value and the protective mechanism that boundaries provided. Well, she also learned that sin is destructive. 
with sin comes shame, comes embarrassment. It wasn't until they uh, disobeyed God that they uh, noticed that they were not clothed. And so they sewed fig leaves together to uh, cover themselves. Well, that was, uh, that, that came with the fall. And with it came a guilty conscience to the point where they hid uh, from God as if one could successfully do that. Well, even what they provided for themselves was not covering enough, so God uh, provided a, a, a clothing of animal skins, having shed blood to provide a remedy, not just to cover them physically, but also cover for the sins that they had uh, committed. So sin is destructive. They learned that as they uh, watched how their descendants lived. One thing about uh, the beauty of the way God made you and me, he, he made us uh, creatures uh, of choice. We have the freedom yeah. to exercise uh, our capacity to make uh, good decisions mm -hmm. and similarly exercise our capacity to make very poor decisions. Cain made some bad decisions. Abel made some good decisions. Mm -hmm. And we see the lineage of Cain and the lineage uh, later of Seth, who was born instead of Abel after Cain slew his brother Abel. And we see a stark contrast between the, the lineage of the two. Cain uh, refused to comply with what uh, God expected of him when he refused to bring a blood sacrifice. But through the line of Seth, we see that... Uh, it was uh, marked with uh, men and women who lived for God and uh, did their best to carry on the uh, tradition of uh, a, a reverence and obedience to the, the service of the Lord. With uh, Cain's descendants uh, came murder and uh, polygamy, adultery, and all kinds of uh, uh, chaos. Well, eventually that came upon the whole human race to the point where uh, God looked upon man who had created and was grieved in his soul, which brought uh, the flood and the destruction of the human race, save Noah and uh, his wife and the eight in all. So sin is destructive, but despite her failure, God did provide that remedy. God did, as she's called here, the, the mother of all living because she's the mother of the Savior. But she's your mother and my mother. She's the mother of the human race. Uh, that's one thing that is sadly lacking in understanding in our world today. We're all brothers and sisters. Right. We trace our lineage back to the first parents. Yeah. So through uh, Eve, uh, the Savior was born. And so uh, we also uh, learn not only about boundaries and about the destructive nature of sin, but also about uh, the uh, redemptive nature that is found in the seed of the woman. Not the seed of man, but the seed of a woman would bruise the head of the serpent. And so it was that uh, the Virgin Mary gave birth uh, to your Savior and mine. And that's uh, the redemptive value that is still found through the, the human race in, the, in that sense. So she was a, a woman in need, but she also learned the value of teaching her children that just as uh, disobedience and rebellion has uh, or have far-reaching consequences, and she saw, saw that through the lineage of Cain. So does obedience and compliance with God have far-reaching uh, consequences. On the opposite side, uh, there's, there are blessings. That's one thing when sometimes when Debbie testifies, she uh, testifies about how uh, she, she grew up here in Medford and saw a contrast, an overwhelming 
a number of aunts and uncles, one Aunt Dina who's here uh, this morning, uh, being one who served God and lived for God. And she saw relatively few who didn't, but she saw, she saw the contrast and knew as a child that uh, she wanted to, to live the way that they lived. Amen. She wanted to have the blessings and benefits that, that they appeared to have. So she chose to serve God, and perhaps that influenced Seth and his descendants, including Enoch, who walked with God and was not, or God took him, and all the way down uh, to Noah, mm -hmm. who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. They, they saw the other side yeah. and said, I, I can figure this out. There's a lot I don't know in life, uh, but I can, I can uh, do an analysis, a cost-benefit analysis, and see that it, it costs heavily mm -hmm. to leave God and leave the path of obedience. Yeah. And I can see that it benefits mightily uh, to serve the Lord. Yeah. So there were good choices. There were bad choices. Eve understood that the, the Sabbath day is holy. God rested. Mm -hmm. He ceased from his labor, if, as if God could labor, but he, he ceased from his uh, creative acts mm -hmm. to convey uh, the value and to set the example for the human race that it pays to step back yeah. a day a week and reflect on the goodness of God, to give thanks to God, to worship God. We live in an age, but it's happened before, but, but it's an age where uh, going to church, attending church has fallen out of favor in many circles. I read a sermon that D.L. Moody preached perhaps 150 years ago and lamented that the fact that the holy day has turned into a holiday. Well, we can't uh, benefit by indicting others uh, if they happen to, to make choices that seem in conflict with God's word, but we can look in our own hearts and do our best to make sure that the Lord's day is a holy day yeah. and to teach our children yeah. to do the same. Amen. Well, we thank God for, for the examples of uh, God-fearing mothers, God-fearing women. It's not automatic. We have to make those choices. True. I didn't grow up in a home with, of a Christian mother. Mom tried, I'll say that. She didn't have the light of the gospel. She, she really wanted to uh, be reverent, I think made us, uh, some of us go to Sunday, uh, to vacation Bible school two weeks every summer. I went, I did not like it. Uh, that's a problem of me and not the VBS people. But we, we just weren't used to that. Why, Sunday was, was a day to go out in the field and play baseball in the summer, football in the, in the fall go down to the barn, we had a bar, a basket hoop up against the, the barn, the old barn, and we, we played by the hour. There's four of us boys, so uh, couldn't get the girls to cooperate really, but uh, much as we tried, but we, uh, we played by the hour. We, uh, the, the ground wasn't level beneath the hoop, so on one side of the basket, it was probably maybe the hoop six feet from the ground, and on the other seat, side of the basket, maybe 11 feet from the ground. But we, we developed uh, our layups and our jump shots, and um, to a certain degree, I was sure I was gonna be a Major League Baseball player, and I would have been, except I didn't play baseball very well. <laughs> but I thought I could teach Harlan. He was the youngest of the four boys, the youngest of the seven children. And I was intent on teaching him so he could be a, a major league baseball player, but he just didn't have the passion that I had. <laughs> but the day came when my mother prayed 
That's after I got saved, after Dale got saved, after my sister was saved. And uh, on the first day of January, 1975, she played a New Year's Eve um, a gig at the Douglas County Fairgrounds where about 500 revelers got together and she was a part of this Christian, not Christian, country, uh, Western band. So, but, but she was miserable. She would get her hair all done up before she would go on those uh, deals and uh, pack her big heavy Bible into the hairdresser and back out again. And so she was trying to be religious, but her walk uh, conflicted with her talk. But that day she surrendered and got saved. I, I think she was 40, uh, uh, 46 years old. Because dad got saved the next month at 48. He started praying really earnestly before she did. But anyway, uh, both grew up in dysfunctional homes, gravely dysfunctional homes. But they never used that as an excuse even later on for their uh, bad decisions or their problems. So if you were reared in a dysfunctional home, well, God bless you. There's still victory in Jesus. She prayed and uh, prayed through, and it was evident. She quit that band, began going to church, and uh, lived for the Lord until she uh, died at the age of 90. Well, we thank God for uh, the remedy provided through that first mother, your mother. That remedy is still available today. It's found at the foot of the cross. It's found uh, through God's Son. So if you've not experienced this great salvation, it doesn't matter the walk you've walked in the past, you can start a new walk in Jesus today, and that'll be the best gift you could ever give your mother. And if you began that walk already, uh, the best gift you can give your mother is keep on going. Uh, The trumpet's gonna sound one of these days, Uh, If your mother's God-fearing, she'll be raptured out of this world, and you want to be one of those who is there in the air to give a shout alongside her. So we'll sing a song of invitation. Uh, I'm not sure how you're doing it here under uh, COVID, but we have some room at the altars, lots of room where you're seated. Let's look heaven's way as a body of believers.